BFG people, hello and welcome to Blockchain Insider. I'm Mauricio Magaldi, Global Strategy Director for Crypto at 11FS, and this is episode 195. I'm joined as always by my amazing co-host, Kai Sheffield, Head of Crypto at Visa. Welcome to the show today. How are you doing, Kai? I'm fantastic. I'm excited. This is one of my favorite topics. I think it's a very timely show and, you know, stable coins are the killer app of crypto. So we, we got to unpack them. Absolutely. So there's been some pretty heavy news in the industry about stable coins, especially how players like PayPal, Circle and Coinbase are getting increasingly involved. So today we're going to dive deep into the latest stablecoin launches and look at what this means for the industry more broadly. With their increasing popularity, can stablecoins become a core financial infrastructure in the world today? So for that, we're going to welcome our guest, Zach Abrams, co-founder of Bridge. Thanks for joining us in the show. How are you doing today? And can we learn a little bit more about you and Bridge? Yeah, absolutely. And excited to excited to be here, excited to be a part of this, this conversation. So a little bit of quick background on me. I've spent my whole career in fintech and payments. I'm the co-founder of Bridge, but before this, uh, um, started another payments company that was building on top of university payment networks, which are like their own unique payment network that uh, nobody thinks about. And uh, we sold that company to Square. And then I spent a bunch of time leading product at Square. Um, I led the consumer business at Coinbase and product and design at Brex. And then uh, similar to, uh, to Kai, gained lots of conviction that stable coins were going to be really important financial infrastructure. And so we started Bridge, which... Um, builds uh, stablecoin payments APIs, you know, a year and some change ago. Good. Okay. So before we dive in, just as a reminder to the listeners, the views or opinions of our panel are their own and don't necessarily reflect those of the companies that they are representing. And as always, nothing we say should be taken as tax, financial, or legal advice. So go do your own research. So let's do a quick refresher on what stablecoins are and how they came to be. As, as the name suggests, a stablecoin is a cryptocurrency that is pegged or tied to gold or fiat to maintain its stable value, meaning one to one. Because it's backed by a more traditional instrument, stable coins tend to offer a more stable alternative to other cryptocurrencies that are more volatile, like Bitcoin and Ether and, and all other native cryptocurrencies. Right now, the most popular stable coins are Tether, USDT, with around $84 billion of dollars in market cap, billion with a B, followed by USDC, which is just shy of $26 billion, and DAI from MakerDAO at $5 billion. So every one of those are USDC-pagged, meaning they relate close to one-to-one -one against the US dollar. So a lot is happening in the space, especially in the past couple of weeks. So let's do a quick recap on some of these headlines. So first is PayPal. PayPal launched a USD-pegged stablecoin by the name PYUSD. It's the ticker. Uh, and this is a pretty big deal because PayPal is a probably the largest fintech with uh, 426 million active accounts and a market share of just over 50% of all the global online payment processing. Um, this stablecoin PYUSD is being issued in partnership with Paxos. Paxos is known for having issued other stablecoins, its own stablecoin, and is almost like an as-a-service provider for this space. And it's this one, PYUSD, packed to the dollar, available to PayPal customers that will be able to pay, send, transfer, and convert from crypto to PYUSD. And then the other story this month was Coinbase is taking a stake in USDC or an investment in Circle, the company issuing USDC. And so Circle and Coinbase previously had a partnership. They jointly co-founded the Center Consortium, which set the issuance and governance standards. Uh, but now Circle will take full control over USDC issuance and governance while Coinbase takes an equity stake in Circle. Uh, and so this will further define how the interest income is you know, distributed between Coinbase and Circle. Yeah, and, and the regulators are not too far behind. Singapore, with the uh, monetary authority, uh, was the probably one of the first uh, countries in the world to actually come to terms and define a stablecoin regulation. 
So they have specific requirements for issuers uh, that include the type of reserve and, and the maintenance of reserve assets to uh, support uh, stability, minimum capital requirements, uh, liquid asset requirements to reduce risk of insolvency, time to withdraw, and these are for 11 fiat denominations that are issued in the Singaporean market, which is a big progress in terms of uh, you know leading adoption, which Singapore has been done uh, has been doing in crypto for, for quite some time now. So these are three big uh, stablecoin stories recently in the space. But let's let's try and unpack the impact of these uh, news. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to you, Zach. So let's let's start off with your thoughts about PayPal as as a first you know point of our debate today. Yeah, I mean. So we started, uh, maybe just starting at the highest level. Yeah, we started a year in four or five months ago. And uh, in the stablecoin space, it has been a stream of nothing but bad news. <laughs> um, from like Terra Luna to FTX, which was a meaningful contributor to USDC, to USDC pegging, to you know the BUSD situation. And the PayPal launch was really the first bit of like, really um like amazingly positive news that i feel like has happened in the space in a year and a half two years like you mentioned it's a big regulated company that's moving into the space the first one that has done that two it's in the u.s you know there has been a lot of uh, pessimism about u.s and u.s stablecoin issuance and our leadership there but the two you know two of the more meaningful um, you know, truly fiat back stablecoin projects are now in the in the US. I think it begins to clear the way for others who might want to either start using or engaging in the space or issuing on their own to follow PayPal's lead. So I think it's a pretty uh it's it's like very, very positive news for the space overall. And um we were obviously quite excited. So in terms in terms of the way this is working, in terms of the partnership with Paxos, which is now very known for helping firms to launch their stablecoin, do you do you feel that this is like an emerging pattern in terms of I'm a web to so to say company and I'm interested in dabbing into the world of crypto? Stablecoins seem like a more accessible way uh, in terms of even you know, being a regulated entity, then partnering with with someone uh, like Paxos to kind of facilitate that portion because you don't have to do everything yourself, I reckon. But this is not the first time. And Paxos has actually made this kind of a part of their business model. Is is this where the industry is headed? Curious to hear what, what Kai thinks here, but on, you know, our, our view is that there will be many stable coins. This was like pretty contrarian a year ago when USDC was, you know, more or less the only regulated game in town. And now with this PYUSD launch, it, it's um, it's less contrarian. Now, now there's at least two. Um, and there will probably be a handful of really branded stable coins that have deep liquidity and that are used for sort of public legs, you know, it, are used for intermediary transactions. And so, you know, players like PayPal who enable folks who are not crypto native to wade into these waters, it's, they're going to be, you know, incredibly important infrastructure providers and are already proving to be. And, you know, we work really closely with, with their team on a bunch of fronts, but, you know, we think that that infrastructure will be, will be super important. We also believe that there will be thousands of other stablecoins that are issued that no one will know even exists. And the, we kind of call these infrastructure tokens that will sit purely behind the scenes. And when you send money, a stablecoin from application A to application B, application B will settle it in their own stablecoin. And at Bridge, we're helping company create these more sort of behind the scenes settlement stable coins. And so we think both of these will live in the world, these big branded stable coins like USDC and PayPal USD, and there will be there will be a few others. And we think there will be these infrastructure stable coins where funds where funds settle and can go into why I think that's gonna gonna be the case. But you know, Kai, I would love to hear what, what you think. Yeah. So so first I think 
overall, this is the biggest news in crypto and payments you know, of the year, and and maybe over the the past several years. And so I think it's hard to understate how much legitimacy having a a large you know one of the largest digital wallets like PayPal you know launching a stablecoin to consumers over a public blockchain brings and how many conversations that drives inside institutions and digital wallets across the world saying wait a minute PayPal did what they issued a stablecoin should we issue a stablecoin like what does it mean to issue a stablecoin and i think for a long time stablecoins have existed in this crypto capital markets infrastructure phase. And it's been very clear, every exchange, everyone that is trading crypto knows what stablecoins are and probably uses them, but they haven't crossed that chasm to payments and particularly not retail payments in a mainstream way. And so I think PayPal is kind of the first indication of if this is successful, you know, those are the the types of companies that that could do that. Now, I think to to your you know, point in, in want to unpack your thesis, Borzak, like the most interesting questions to ask, you know, as you think about the stablecoin ecosystem, in, in my mind, number one is how many stablecoins will exist? And, you know, to me, that's, is it three? Is it 30? Is it 300? Is it 3,000? And there's a big difference in how the ecosystem plays out depending upon what that answer is. And then I think the other derivative questions of that are, how much will brands matter? Will consumers actively have a preference for a brand? Like, will they say, I want USDC or I want PYSD? Or will it just be abstracted away and just show as USD you know, to the consumer? And then I think the last question is just, what will the regulatory requirements be, which is still continuing to unfold and we'll see what happens with the stablecoin bill. Um, and so I think those are the questions that that most payment companies and wallets you know, are are likely debating now, and whether or not you should issue a stablecoin, I think is very much dependent upon where you think that those three questions are are going to land. And so, Mauricio, I'm I'm curious first your perspective on how many stablecoins will exist three to five years from now, and then would love to unpack like Zach why you think there will be so many that that are out there. Yeah, I I. I'm I'm happy that uh, we have Zach today saying this because I once I I told this and people are like you're nuts. There's a concentration. This happened in every industry, and I'm like, no, wait, hear me out. Uh, we're gonna tackle CBDCs later on the show, but the way we're seeing CBDCs emerge is there are two layers. One is wholesale, the other one is retail. But most countries are not trying to do retail because retail means you have liability against the central bank as an individual, and not every central bank wants to be accounted for that. Now, that means that the banks that are regulated will be able to peg stable coins or tokenized deposits against a CBDC that is issued by their central bank. So the amount of stable coins are, as, 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 as Zach said, that are doing like ordinary settlement on an open world could be, you know, as many as banks are there. Right. So I feel that that is a very strong thesis in terms of path forward. But one thing that might attract other than the brand is that because stable coins can be tied to underlying traditional instruments that can reward the deposits with interest, depending on the paper that is underlying the peg, stable coins can reward holders as well. And this could be another mechanism of attraction for individuals and businesses that want to hold balances in stable coins and then have a little bit of that underlying asset benefit being rewarded just for, you know, staking that, that stable. So I feel that there is a pattern there that goes beyond stable coins seen as just means of exchange that could be very interested in, in business constru constructs as we move forward in kind of bridging DeFi and TradFi. But this is just a glimpse of what, you know, it's living in my very weird mind. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, what you said sort of triggered, triggered a thought that there was sort of like an early, one of the early things that got uh, me excited about stablecoins and like, because you were talking about the interest bearing aspect of them. So, t so today, you know, you, you have a US dollar. And you can pick with that U.S. dollar either 
to spend it or to save it. And the most direct manifestation of this is that you either put it in a checking account, in which case you get no savings, but you can tie it to a debit card and you can spend it and you could do ACH and pay- bill payments and everything else, or you put it in a savings account, in which case it's harder to move, but it but it earns some form of yield in that in that savings account. But you pick one or the other. And one of the interesting aspects of a stable coin is that it actually gives you the ability to do both. You take a dollar and it and it's invested, and then you get a synthetic asset that it's used to transact. And this is one of like the like what you were what you were mentioning is like you actually have a transactional asset that is yield bearing. Now most of that yield has not been which doesn't really exist. Most of that yield right now goes to the issuers, and you know there's like regulatory reasons reasons for that. But it is a really uh, economically compelling reason for companies to build or individuals to want to hold uh, stable coins. And, you know, one of the things I believe, you know, I spent a whole, you know, almost my whole career in fintech. One of the things that's amazing about it is that, you know, it's super rational. Markets are super rational. They're really regulated. So it takes time. So it's not like things change overnight. But uh, over time, when things are, you know, there's an economic benefit or speed benefit, that thing wins. Uh, it might take a decade, it might take two, but but it generally finds a way to persevere. And this aspect of stablecoins is super, super compelling. Yeah, too. I think it's worth like taking a step back and make sure that the the listeners you know understand like stablecoins have one of the most simple, understandable business models in crypto. You know, it's interest income. You know, today, the way that they work is consumers give you dollars, you know, as a stablecoin issuer, you can deposit those dollars you know, into commercial bank uh, deposits as well as U.S. treasuries. And then you give them back a token that they can transact with, but does not pay interest in the current form of, of most stablecoins. And so seeing the amount of interest income that, you know, issuers like Tether are generating today uh, which is is having amazing profits for them in terms of you know the operational costs and expenses of running the stablecoin versus the interest income they're generating, and then companies like Circle and and Coinbase. It'll be really interesting to see how that evolves. Where you know the seems to be the primary motivation of why a company would create their own stablecoin versus use an existing one is the business model of being able to capture that interest income. And so if they're operating a digital wallet and they're saying, wait a minute, I'm holding a bunch of these tokens on my platform, why is the interest income going to someone else? If I create my own stablecoin, I can gather the interest income. And so I'm curious, do you both see that as the number one driver and incentive of instead of everyone just embracing the few stablecoins that exist today, why more people might create them. And then I think it's also very much tied to what the interest rate environment is. When interest rates are where they are today, that's one thing. I remember a few years ago when people were concerned about negative interest rates and they're saying it might cost money to create a stable coin versus being able to make money. And so interested how you both see the interest income, even ignoring the consumer uh, because of the, some of the regulatory challenges there, how will businesses in fintechs and wallets approach that opportunity of both stable coins as tokens that can improve payments, but stable coins as a business model with the interest income that can be generated you know, off of them? The interest income is absolutely important, especially today when it's you know five plus percent. The interest income is is uh, cannot I cannot say it enough. It is extremely compelling. And, you know, for anybody who is holding another stable coin to effectively create their own stable coin, basically just generates, you know, 100% margin (laughs) revenue overnight. But there is another benefit, and it is quite meaningful is, you know, there is when you're holding a stable coin and someone else's stable coin, that represents counterparty risk. So, uh, and we saw what happened in March when USDC depegged. And so when it's your own stable coin with your own cash, 
you have total transparency into the reserves. You can manage those reserves in a way that best aligns with your business. And you can create whatever policies around those reserves such that you have the safety you feel like you need. So issuing your own stable coin comes with lower risk and higher return, uh, which you can, which like coming back to the economically compelling part is a reason why I think there will be there will be more and more of these out in the world. But those two reasons are at play. Today, though, the, 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 the interest rate environment is such that, that, that the, the yield aspect of it is certainly the driver, but both are at play. Yeah, I think, I think if, we, if we can discount and, and think of stable coins as something that needs to be environmental neutral, meaning they should be able to function whether there's a higher or lower interest rate market as a piece of the infrastructure. There, there should be at least a component on efficiencies for operating at a rail that is, you know, f- final and you know online twenty four seven. Especially if they're managing a, a retail relationship with other users, so ease of use and 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 the lack of you know overbearing procedural you know uh, you know processes and paperwork should be enough to uh, yield efficiencies over that. So I, I'm, I haven't done the, the modeling and the stress testing, but I, I would assume that uh, because we're actually tackling those, those efficiencies as we introduce blockchain-based infrastructure in, in various use cases, efficiencies are probably one of the most prominent and, and they kind of, they're independent of the environment uh, in terms of interest rates. So I, I would assume that that, Carry on a stable coin business is definitely something that will make it easier and more efficient to handle than having to deal maybe with, you know, your own bank or other payment rails or stuff that stops six o'clock, right? So I, I feel that that's one of the reasons to kind of pursue. I feel like today, like what stable coins are competing with from a payment perspective are, I would say, like international bank wires and SWIFT and correspondent banking as the number one competitor where they're showing some real traction. And so if you're looking to make particularly large value global payments, you know, being able to make those payments on chain and, and stable coins very simply turn blockchains into fiat payment rails. And so I think before stable coins, blockchains just, they were you know, rails that you could move these volatile tokens over, but they weren't fiat payment rails. Now it's like all of this infrastructure that was built out can now apply to transferring dollars. And I think that's a, a really big deal. But I, I also want to cover like the, the counter, you know, Zach, you talked about the benefits of why a fintech might want to create their own stablecoin. But is it the downside, this concept of wildcat banking? And like, you know, back in the day, didn't every bank, they had their own you know, dollar bills and, and it was a mess. And so like, do we want a world where consumers have to manage, you know, 25 different, you know, branded coins in a single wallet and how many PayPal coins versus Coinbase USDC coins versus like, how does that actually play out with consumers? If, if fintechs want the benefits, it seems like the downside is how do you bootstrap a network effect and get acceptance of your stable coin? If, if it's only on your platform, then there's not that much of a point of it. You want it to be able to flow over these public blockchain rails into many other wallets across the world. And so how do you see that playing out of if you have many fintechs creating their own coins, how consumers will manage them and like what infrastructure is required to to do that behind the scenes? Yeah. So we think there's, you know, there will be a lot of these stable coins. (laughs) And, And to your point, like if there are a lot of these stable coins, then it's not really going to be feasible for consumers to sort of have, you know, 300 different like branded stable coins in their wallet, understand, you know, which one to use in what circumstance and, and so on. And our view as to how that plays out is there will be infrastructure providers that are, you know, you know this is exactly what we are building. There'll be infrastructure providers like Bridge that effectively enable you to take any existing stable coin and move it through these, this new type of payment rail 
it converted instantly into any other stable coin. So let's say you have an application and uh, that application is stable coin based for whatever reason, right? They've chosen to um, manage, you know, you, you have a dollar balance in their application and that dollar balance under the hood is managed via stable coins. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't know it. They then enable you to send in USDC, PYUSD, uh, USDT, a CBDC, anything. And all of those different dollar formats, USD, all of those different dollar formats will flow through, you know, either our API or someone else's API and then convert it into this application stable coin at the core. Um, and so because these stable coins are digital dollars, you can effectively instantly convert them in and out of whatever format is necessary. Um, at the core of this app is their own stable coin, but people can deposit money in via whatever dollar type they want, all running through, through, you know, our infrastructure settled in this dollar. So then they get the benefits of and the benefits of the stable coin. So the yield and the lower counterparty risk, and then they can send it back out as a CBDC or as USDC or anything else. And this stable coin that sits in the middle, most people will never know it's there. And so our view is that these public legs of a transaction where you're sending money between applications, those will predominantly be handled by uh, the big branded stable coins. Um, because you know those are what people are going to know. So you'll be sending PYUSD or USDC or USD um, or a CBDC. Uh, but then when funds settle, people will choose to orchestrate them into their own stablecoin at the core because for those economic reasons that we talked about. Uh, and this infrastructure enables you to have thousands of different stablecoins all of which are interoperable with each other and consumers never need to think about the actual conversion experience. You can, you can be a person who's totally loyal to USDC and through the process move into and out of USDC to other stablecoins without even really doing anything. And that's, that's how we think this world, this world evolves. And the interesting thing, kind of your point is that with these stablecoins, uh, because, and you know, we've said this whole call talking about stable coins, all the ones that we're pretty much talking about are fiat backed stable coins, not the algorithmic ones. And with fiat backed stable coins, in order to do these conversions, you don't need liquidity. You don't need trading markets. You don't need trading pairs. All of this can be done directly with payments infrastructure, which, um, which makes it much, much, much more scalable. Awesome. So, there's a lot more to talk about. We're going to take a break right now, and we'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Visa, one of the world's leaders in digital payments. Crypto has opened up a new world of possibilities, and Visa is helping everyone take part. Consumers can now enjoy the freedom and flexibility of using their Visa crypto link cards for everyday purchases at millions of Visa-accepting merchant locations around the world. Join us in this new money movement. Learn more at visa.com forward slash crypto. Hello, it's Benjamin here, Director of Research and Strategy at 11FS. Earlier this year, we published Building the Future of Home Buying, a report that calls out financial services for making the biggest, most significant purchase of most people's lives way more difficult than it needs to be. Well, fast forward to today and things haven't changed. Mortgage offerings are more important now than they have ever been, with sky-high interest rates in many countries forcing home buyers to shop around. We've got clients asking us how to move quickly to fix the problem and get a game-changing product to market. Want to know the secret? Step one, download the report at 11fs.com slash homebuying. Step two, get in touch at 11fs.com slash ventures. Speak soon. So welcome back. So let's uh, wrap up what we were just discussing, and then we're going to jump right into the CBDC sky. Yeah, so it's really interesting if I understand your you know, thesis correctly here, Zach. It's almost like there will be multiple types of stable coins, where there will be, even within the all fiat-backed you know, bucket, there will be payment stable coins, which effectively act as rails that you know, enable interoperability between wallets. And then there are what effectively I would think about as like banking as a service stable coins, where you know, today you have you know, fintech ecosystems, you know, primarily in the US and in Europe, where you have a bank that's willing to be a bank sponsor 
uh, for a fintech and effectively enable a kind of type of correspondent account you know, that the fintech could hold there and then offer accounts to consumers, that could be replaced by a type of stablecoin that's not meant to be transferred, but only meant to represent fiat being held. And that could potentially be more global. It could be more transparent, you know, have better compliance controls than existing forms of bank sponsorship or correspondent banking. But you don't have to rely on bootstrapping I'm going to have to go and get every other wallet in the world to recognize and accept my stablecoin if you have the ability to convert it into one of the major payment stablecoins before it's sent to another wallet. Is that the the way that you're you're thinking about it? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And and you know the the comparison to sort of the existing infrastructure was was spot on is like we really think about this as a replacement to FBO banking infrastructure versus like, you know, something else like creating your own token or, or what have you. And so a lot of the use cases that we're focused on are, you know, entities that are building global products. So they're building global products that need more or less what FBO infrastructure provides. But if you're doing it across LATAM or across Africa or, you know, across multiple geos, it's uh, not really feasible to build that using fiat infrastructure and building using stable coins is like literally one one thousandth the engineering and 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 uh, cost to build. And so you're you're exactly right. We think that this will be a core part of the fintech stack and is a totally different class of stable coin versus versus PYUSD. So then, what does this mean for banks? And as we get into kind of the role that banks can play, it seems like today the primary role banks play is holding the underlying fiat behind stablecoins issued by fintechs. Will banks start to issue their own stablecoins or tokenized deposits? And I, I'm curious how how each of you would define like where is the line between a stablecoin or a tokenized deposit? Like if a stablecoin is issued by a bank for their own customer, is it a tokenized deposit? And then Mauricio, you mentioned Brazil as as this example of what role do you see central banks playing where it felt like two years ago, you know, the the most common conversation was, oh, we're gonna create retail CBDC and we're gonna provide this product directly to consumers. But now it feels like central banks are now trying to sit at a, a deeper layer in the infrastructure, enabling banks and fintechs you know, to have a competitive ecosystem of retail digital currency products that sit on top of it. I think central banks have two roles that are important for that adoption. The first one is clarity on regulatory frameworks. Like there's no no possibility of we seeing uh, widespread stable coin or CBDCs or tokenized deposit adoption without a proper clear, structured, comprehensive, you know, battle-tested regulatory framework to enable that. And, and, and it's the right thing to do um, to protect consumers and businesses from experimentation. Uh, we, we are at a stage of experimentation, but we, if you want to take this to scale, we need to act as adults, and, and, and we should, right? So I think that's one role. The second role is the role of fostering innovation. And and by that, I mean deciding what archetype architecture they're going to bring to the table when they introduce CBDCs into the economy. And the reason why I keep bringing Brazil up is not just because I'm Brazilian, uh, maybe that too, potentially, um, but because the way the Brazil Central Bank has decided to organize the CBDC architecture seems to me the one that gives banks more freedom to innovate. And that is a big deal in Brazil. It's a wholesale CBDC for now, running on Hyperledger Bezel, which is a EVM, Ethereum compatible chain. And the only participants touching that CBDC is the central bank and the banks. Retail businesses are not going to touch that form of money. But the banks can do two things. One is uh, work with tokenized deposits and therefore choose what type of technology they're going to issue those deposits on. 
and also do the same with stable coins uh, on the same fashion, with a slightly different that tokenized deposits might have less of an acceptance on the open world of decentralized finance, whereas stable coins are going to be probably more accepted and, and designed for that uh, in Brazil. Brazil has resolved instant payments with PIX, so that's off the scope for uh, for CBDCs. But stable coins are fair game, and even if if that is the case for the banks to issue, and that's why I like the, the, the Zach's thesis on various stable coins that are either niche or uh, functionally dedicated. Um, that archetype of an architecture enables that. If if a smaller bank wants to do something like this, they can. If a larger bank wants to say, okay, let's move you know, 50% of our treasury to stable coins so we can have a better grasp on the tokenized um, real world assets, yeah, let's do that as well. So I, th I think that there's a lot more that central banks can do. I'm not saying that Brazilian central bank is to be taken as a blueprint, but if you're a central banker and you're not thinking how you're going to balance innovation and control, you're already five years behind, in my opinion. And then, Zach, how, how do you see this relationship between banks and stablecoins uh, evolving? Do you think that the primary role is just going to be holding reserves when fintechs and you know, state-regulated money transmitters are the issuers? Do you see them starting to compete in issuing their own products? Uh, like, I, what role do you think banks are going to play three to five years from now you know, in the stablecoin ecosystem, in the vision that, that, that you laid out? I mean, I think if we use the, the FBO structure as, a, as an example, I think that things could play out very similar to this world where there's going to be uh, core infrastructure providers that banks work with that enable them to facilitate payments and maybe even do issuances in in this space. I think there will be the equivalent of banking as a service companies that do this for banks, farming out deposits to them. And then I think there will be some banks who do the whole stack themselves, uh, you know, like the equivalent of a column or a lead bank. I think that will likely be rare given how... Uh, divergent this technology is versus you know the existing infrastructure that, that banks have and so uh, I, I think that ultimately like the foundation of stablecoin issuance is built on top of banks um, and then it's really just a question of that for for that individual bank how far up the stack they will choose to go the thesis that we're making is that they will uh, choose to do what they do really well which is banking <laughs> And then they will partner with other folks who will enable them to uh, manage these payments and create these stable coins. What about the role of different blockchains? Like, I feel like that's that's the other interesting dynamic here, where it's not just sure you could have a world of multiple stable coins, but if they all run on top of the same blockchain, then that's you know, at least only one other dimension. If you have multiple stable coins. And then you have multiple blockchains. Now it's this like 3D, 4D, like, you know, how do you see that playing out of, will there be some convergence of, you know, a small number of blockchains or one blockchain? Or do you think that there's only going to be more networks that individual stable coins are run on? And one stable coin might run on 12 different networks as we're seeing. It sounds like USDC is just continuing to expand the number of networks that, that they support. I mean, I, I wish I knew the answer. I mean, a couple of years ago, everyone thought that it was going to be this proliferation of L1s. Now, like this year, everyone is creating their own L2. And, you know, I, I think, you know, that could play out or there could be some consolidation of both. I think another dimension, though, Kai, is that, that I am, I don't know the answer on, but I think is a really big question for how the space evolves is whether these stable coins end up predominantly being issued on these public blockchains like Ethereum or so on, or what the industry ends up standardizing around are permission blockchains, which are not very popular today, but you see like the JP Morgan coin and earlier, you know, Signet and so on using. Right now, it's obviously the public blockchains are, are the dominant form. But depending on where regulation goes and what banks are comfortable with, I could see a world where the majority of stablecoin volume actually happens on 
permission blockchains, which then creates its own, you know, fifth dimension <laughs> uh, in, in managing issuance. I I do see I do see a pattern. I do see a pattern emerging, which is CBDCs, the central bank digital currencies, by and large, uh, are they can be on blockchains or they can be on something else, other technologies. But the ones that are issued on blockchains might follow the pattern of permission blockchains, especially if they're wholesale and the banks and the central banks are involved, because then you can actually manage that infrastructure a lot better. But then again, the banks are on the edges of that network, and they will be pegging CBDCs against stablecoins and issuing say the stablecoins into the world, and and that can absolutely happen on public blockchains, especially because if we think that stablecoins role in cross border payments, remittances, and whatnot, play a much easier or less friction path if they're on public blockchains. Because then it's just the infrastructure is already global, is already borderless, is already 24-7. It kind of makes sense for the use case that that is the infrastructure of choice. And then back to my earlier point, it comes, you know, the role of the regulator to enable that as part of their remit as well. Yeah, I think will the question of will banks be able to interact with or issue tokens on public blockchains, or will they be limited to permission blockchains, is one of the most important questions in the space. And I think what's been interesting to observe is some of the banks outside the United States, if you look at you know, some of the banks in, in Australia, they've effectively issued, at least in pilot form, stable coins on public blockchains. If you talk to banks in the United States, you know, it, it seems like that's like, whoa, like it's a public blockchain. Like what, 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 what could we do with that? Um, and it feels likely both of them will coexist. But one distinction I think is important is, is it a broad effort to create bank-to-bank -bank payment infrastructure, which I think wholesale CBDC and JPM coin and some of those others fit into, which I think permission blockchains you know, can serve the purpose? Or is it an effort to enable a payment token to exist in a broader ecosystem of applications that are being built outside the banking ecosystem. And so then if it's you know, NFTs and DeFi and Web3 gaming, that's where it's harder for me to imagine how permission blockchains are effective because it's impossible to predict what application is gonna be successful and what game is gonna be successful. And those games aren't gonna build on the permission blockchain. And so there has to be some balance between maybe you have bank to bank or central bank operated systems running on permission blockchains, very limited purpose, you know, it's just focused on transferring value between financial institutions, but then some way that whether it's banks or fintechs are able to create products that run on public blockchains backed by you know, some form of fiat, either in a permission token or not, that can then meet consumers where they are. And so this interplay between permission and public, I think, is going to be one of the most important trends in the next few years. And it's interesting you point to this because... The moment we find that balance, we're going to look in hindsight and say, ah, yeah, that's obvious. <laughs> we've, we've been running around this thing for so long. And yeah, it was uh, in our faces, you know, the whole time. So unfortunately, we do have to wrap up today's episode, which has been great. So thanks, both of you, for joining us. Uh, how can people learn more about you and your companies? Uh, I'll go with you, Zach. Yeah, I mean, the, the company is bridge.xyz. So just visit us online. And uh, if you're interested, fill out a form and someone will someone will follow up with you. Great. Kai. On Twitter at Kai Sheffield and visa.com slash crypto. And you can find me on Twitter at 0x Mauricio or on LinkedIn, Mauricio Magaldi or 11fs.com. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, subscribe to our podcast so you never miss an episode. We have loads in the works and we're so excited to be talking about crypto and blockchain with all of you again. If you can wait until the next episode, take a look at the many previous episodes on the catalog and get yourself properly immersed in the world of crypto. If you really love it, please leave us a review. It helps us to make it better and helps other people find the show. As always, if you want to join the conversation, find us on social media. Just search for 11FS or Blockchain Insider or email us at podcasts at 11FS.com. This is all for today. Stay rare, stay weird, 
LFG. 